Okay, so I am Dr. K. J. Raman. So I am a visiting professor at the Middle East Technical University, Ankara, Turkey, and also director of propulsion systems of Wales Marine Research International Limited in India. So I am going to talk about these rocket principles and propulsion system. So. Okay, so then uh, how do things move? Actually, in um, no, no, just one. So we have uh, two big shots about the rockets, uh, which uh, the rocket pioneers, which they have uh, a hypothesis the how the rockets will uh, move. So Isaac Newton and Galileo. Okay, so out of this two. So we have uh, two guys. It's like Aristotle has uh, mentioned that objects move only as long as we apply a force for to them. Okay. Whereas Galileo's experiments are mentioned that objects keep moving after we stop applying a force if there is no friction. So that is the one which is uh, 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 real thing. Okay. Then another thing is. Uh, Aristotle has mentioned that falling bodies fall at a constant rate, which, may, which is not true actually. Falling bodies accelerate as they fall based on its acceleration. Okay, so then another thing is like heavy bodies fall faster than light ones, which is also not true. Actually, heavy bodies fall at the same rate as, same rate as light ones. So that is the Galileo's experiment. So out of these two things, Galileo's experiments has proven as a scientific one, so then um, we have to adopt that uh, Galileo's uh, thing. Okay, so then the yeah next next one. So. From the Galileo's experiment, uh, next uh, in the next step, Newton has proposed several laws. Out of that, first law is like body moves in a straight line unless acted on by some force. It means that if there is no uh, uh, <clears throat> other action force. The body moves in a straight line. Okay. Then another thing is the uh, acceleration of the, the second law. Acceleration of your body is proportional to the force on it. That is like F force is equal to mass into acceleration. Then Newton's third law is to every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. Okay, these are the three laws which uh, Newton has proposed. Okay, so then uh, the, the Newton's first or second law again, it is the same. Uh, Force equal to change of momentum with respect to time f equal to uh, derivative of uh, the time time derivative of mass into x uh, velocity. Then <clears throat> then force then uh, time derivative of mass into velocity is acceleration. So that is m equal to m into a. So that is change in velocity. So the Newton's third law there is a, for each and every force there is equal and opposite force. So that is from the Newton's third law of motion. We can see that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So if you see the rocket, which is uh, uh, going in a uh, <coughs> particular direction, there is uh, opposite and equal reaction is happening based on the uh, exhaust velocity. Okay, that is exhaust jet. So that is the momentum which creates the reaction to the forward motion of the rocket. Yeah, this is Newton's first law. Again, it is the same thing. So it is like, so there is a, a reaction 
always uh, there is an action that is opposite uh, uh, force there is a reaction is happening so that is that is from the gases which is the action is created so uh, the react uh, <coughs> reaction is uh, uh, acted on the rocket which uh, propels the rocket at a particular speed uh, acceleration on this thing then another uh, uh, universal law of gravitation also uh, isaac newton has proposed there is a two masses which is uh, having some distance among the bit, among them so that uh, <coughs> that pulling force among the two objects is based on the uh, g m1 m2 by r square g is the uh, the gravitational constant m1 m2 is the mass of the two bodies and r is the distance between the two bodies so he proposed the universal uh, gravitation law so based on that only we are uh, launching the uh, <coughs> satellite and uh, we are calculating the pulling force towards there and uh, we have to uh, overcome the gravitational force so that we can uh, propel the vehicle to the outer atmosphere as well as the other planets so you can see the rocket reaches orbit and no longer needs to burn any more fuel that is no net force on rocket gravity is exactly balanced by the rotation force so <clears throat> that is a centrifugal force that is acting towards the earth that will be nullified by the uh, rotational force of the any bodies uh, revolving around the earth so that means there is no uh, extra fuel is required once we are uh, once the Uh, satellite is positioned at the particular orbit with a particular speed so this is about apollo astronaut so this is the same thing so the rocket sends the rockets and launch vehicles first it is initially the, uh, the uh, spacecraft get into the space so move them around once they get there so change their attitude if the direction is not pointing that once it is uh, positioned at the particular uh, uh, orbit then we don't have to give any power extra power to make the uh, satellite to revolve around the earth so it's a brief about the rocket history so first of all rocket we need to uh, have some uh, energy to propel the rocket so in the early days in china around some 300 bc the that is the first earliest rocket which was recorded so they have used some black powder to get the energy so then uh, in the 1900 uh, constantine iskovsky has started to working on the rocket uh, field so then uh, he developed the orbital mechanics and rocket equation which is very essential to keep the satellite and the particular uh, orbit and uh, how or the uh, thrust required and the mass of the uh, object that is the satellite the payload and the other uh, um, propulsion systems requirement so that is the pioneer one he developed so uh, after that in the united states in 1920 uh, robert goddard has started the first fuel a uh, liquid fuel rocket because uh, we have to get more energy with respect to the uh a fuel mass so if you use some solid propellant or liquid propellant so uh, solid propellant also giving more ma energy that is more thrust but whereas in liquid fuel rocket we can get more thrust with less mass because uh, whenever we are uh, talking about the space uh, um, uh, transportation we have to worry about the mass okay that that means if you use a liquid rocket so that will be good so then in 1940s uh, germany from germany the von braun is the he started the v2 rocket so then uh, hermann uh, simultaneously hermann oberth also started working on the rocket so you can uh, see the pictures of images of the uh, goddard <coughs> this is uh, discolski and uh, von braun
so so it's about elaborate so the chinese is claimed the, by many to be the invented of the first black powder so because so in china uh, some kind of uh, pyro uh, stones are there so from that they can easily find out the they can easily formulate the uh, black powders so that is the 300 bc so then uh, after that even in india also has participated in that because uh, tipu sultan uh, tipu sultan also has started working on the rocket so the old chinese document system long trading in making various black powder charges for use in fire crackers because they are pioneer in fire crackers so that can be used for a rocket applications that also uh, they are uh, using it the chinese also developed rockets and flame torches to be used in combat against their enemy particularly for the nearby country mongols okay then uh, arabs also learned the art of uh, rocketry from mongols and europeans from the arabs okay it is like it is just like uh, transmission of uh, knowledge okay from mongols to europeans the from mongols to arabs from arabs to europeans the europeans developed the rocket technology further so that is like uh, <coughs> they have <coughs> given the strong fundamental in 14th and 16th century the english much number uh, roger began improved the black powder the system for use of a rocket propellant fire crackers on is in uh, for use in canon the frenchman improved the heat accuracy of his artillery rockets by launching them <coughs> from tubes an italian fontana experimented with rocket power surface torpedoes so that is uh, now it is like pioneer for uh, several uh, different applications so he developed that so uh, then uh, the next is uh, is like the interest of the rocket as a weapon went to the hypernation during 17th century mainly because of the pure accuracy and compared to other more accurate and restrictive canard so that's why the further improvements are required because whenever we are uh, talking about the defense we require very much accurate one okay so the new dawn of rocketry appeared during the 18th century and especially some 100 years after the right by isaac newton has published his famous three laws because uh, newton has uh, invented in uh, this three laws in uh, 1600s itself but to materialize it it took a lot of time because uh, it it has to be developed in a physical manner during 19th and century, uh, 20th century many men were to become well known that is uh, chikorsky herman warath raman uh, robert hurd godard even so these are all the pioneers to uh, take this rocket technology to the next level it's a realistic uh, thing then uh, that is the rocket history that is the real uh, uh, game starts it's after world war 2 the race for space between the usa and former soviet uh, uh, union has accelerated the development of rocket technology to what we know and use today so first the uh, first world uh, artificial satellite was launched by uh, russia its name is sputnik in october 4 uh, 1957 the next one is like vostok 1 and yuri a gagarin the first man in space in 1961 of 12th april then uh, everybody knows that uh, apollo 11 and the neil armstrong who is the first man who landed the moon and stepped out in the moon stepped in the moon so in uh, july 20th in uh, 1969 okay so come to the rocket parts so what are all the main parts which is uh, assembled in the rockets it's like uh, if you see the top it's a payload then a guidance so then the propellant so that is then the propellant in the propulsion we have uh, propellant mass and propellant structures all these things so what essentially it uh, uh, required for uh, is a designing parameter of the rocket is like mass ratio mass of propellant to the overall mass so that is the one which decides the uh, escape velocity that is the acceleration velocity of the rocket so then i can see that rocket element is the main principle <coughs> so that parts of rockets it's like again it is like a, 
clear thing. The four major parts of the rockets are payload is the cargo, passengers or equipment of the rocket carries, and propellant is the fuel and oxidizer make up about 90% of the weight and lift off. The chamber, the area of the rocket chamber where the propellants are put under pressure. Then the nozzle. So this is the opening end of the chamber that allows the pressurized gas to escape and creates the thrust to propel the rocket. Then the rocket main elements. It's like again, it is the same thing. So it's like we have seen in the <coughs> diagram space. It's like C is the combustion chamber where the combustion, that is the thermal energy, is, uh, that chemical energy is converted into thermal energy. That I is the entrance, that is the nozzle inlet. T is the throat, and E is the exit velo exit of the uh, nozzle. V represents the velocity exit velocity. So this uh, conversion diversion section. So that is the nozzle which is required to propel the to increase the velocity of the inlet gas from the combustion chamber to super, supersonic to hypersonic velocity. So it is required for propel the packet. So again, you can see that uh, in the rocket uh, thing, the, the nozzle flow. So it is like we can see different uh, kind of uh, operations, which is because uh, it is like the rockets so once designed, it, it can it, it has to operate at off design conditions also because uh, if you see the atmospheric pressure, the air, uh, sea surface, sea level, sea level conditions, the pressure is around one bar. So if you go at very high altitude, the pressure will be uh, decreasing. Okay. So, so in any of the case, the rocket has to operate and it gives the thrust to the rocket. Okay, the nozzle has to operate and the, it has to create give the thrust. So it is like at the nozzle entrance, we can see Mach number is around one. The flow is almost so subsonic. That is, it is the entry of the entry from the combustion chamber, <coughs> exit from the combustion chamber. At the throat, the Mach number is equal to one. It is transonic region. So if you see the divergent portion of the nozzle, you can see that <coughs> Mach number is more than, uh, it depends. It's, uh, it's not only Mach number more than uh, three, so it depends, okay. Then we can have, based on the pressure of the exit condition of the nozzle, we have three types of things. It's like, if it is the uh, exit pressure is less than atmospheric pressure, we can say that is the over expansion. If the exit pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure, that is called optimum expansion. Expansion. If the exit pressure is more than atmospheric pressure, that is called under expansion. So the three things happen occur at the different altitudes when once the rocket is getting launched. So here you can see the velocity and the uh, uh, temperature and mark number profiles of the no, <coughs> throughout the nozzle uh, from the end, uh, inlet to the exit. You can see the velocity and pressure is the, the, the pressure and temperature is continuous. That is the first red and uh, brown one, red and <coughs> brown one. So it is like uh, the uh, velocity and uh, sorry pressure and temperature is continuously decreasing. Whereas Mach number and velocity is continuously increasing. So you can see that the uh, Mach number is the uh, green one, that blue is the velocity. So that Mach number is always higher uh, rate of increasing than the velocity because at the because because the Mach number is based on the uh, temperature of the, that is Mach number is equal to V by A that is velocity with respect to the with respect to the acoustical, that means the speed of sound. So the speed of sound is continuously decreasing. That's why Mach number is continuously increasing at higher rate than velocity. So you can see that from the, this is the uh, right, left hand side, it is the CFD simulation. So the temperature and the Mach number uh, profiles. So then you can see the how the rocket, uh, that is the total impulse is, uh, because whenever the, we are uh, <coughs> launching the rocket, we have to find out the specific impulse. That means uh, how much uh, uh, energy, that is the thrust it can produce. So you can see the 
thrust versus pressure profile, so time versus thrust profile. So you can see based on the uh, propellant configuration, we can have the that is the, the burning surface area of the propellant, we can have the thrust profile. So you can see that uh, it is not always constant. So once after ignition, we can have spike the thrust. Thrust is increasing, then based on the grain configuration, the thrust is uh, decreased, then it is increased, then come down. So once the propellant is getting burned out, <coughs> the thrust is come to zero level. So how do we calculate the <coughs> specific impulse? For a particular uh, uh, combustion chamber. So you can see from the right hand side curve. So that is uh, specific impulse is equal to 0 to the integration of 0 to the burnout time. That is f of t is into t dt. That is the f, that is the thrust which is uh, actually produced from the, this uh, we can calculate from the diagram also. Okay. In, the, in, that, in that manner, we can calculate the total impulse of the particular uh, rocket operation. So this is like a static firing of a rocket motor. So that is a hybrid uh, motor. So for the propulsion, we require all spacecraft need to reach about uh, 17,500 miles per hour to get into the orbit. This is the minimum requirement for any orbit, any any uh, any payload to get away from the Earth gravitational force. Okay, so the thrust is pushed to uh, is to push the air spacecraft at fast, at this faster rate. Thrust produced by burning a rocket with fuel with oxygen. Okay, that, there is not enough thrust of a Thrust, the spacecraft will fall back to the Earth due to gravitational force. So, this is the minimum requirement. So, for any kind of mission, so this is like a uh, basic requirement. So, you can see the different types of propellants, the specific impulse, and the ratios. So, you can see that, like, initially, we, if you use uh, a 70 percentage of potassium KNO3 uh, potassium nitrate, sulfur and carbon, we can get around some 830 uh, meter per second of specific impulse. Okay, so if you use uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide and KMO4, okay, hydrogen peroxide as a fuel, KMO4 as a oxidizer, we can get 1442 uh, meter per second of specific impulse. So again, if you increase, if you use some uh, uh, polythene, polythene material like uh, in 65 uh, uh, percentage of KNO3 and 35 percentage of uh, uh, C16, H14O6, that is the poly, um, uh, polybutadiene kind of material. So we can further improve the specific impulse to 1470 meter per second. So if we use other oxidizers like 70 uh, uh, percentage of KC potassium chlorate, and 70 percentage of 17.5 percentage of asphalt and uh, some oil. Oil is the uh, fuel. So then we can further improve the after uh, specific impulse to 1825. So if you use uh, uh, potassium, uh, that is ammonium nitrate and uh, HTBP, that is the hydroxyl terminated polybutadiene and some additives, we can further improve the uh, specific impulse to 1880 meters per second. So if you use uh, nitroglycerin, nitro, nitro solidos, these are all like double base propellants. In the double base propellants, the fuel as well as oxidizer mixing in a molecular level. So then we can uh, further improve the specific impulse to 2200 meter per second. So if you use uh, ammonium perchlorate, and that is the 78 percentage of ammonium perchlorate and 10 percentage of hydroxyl terminated polybutadiene and 7 percentage of AL, we can get the specific impulse of around some 2600 meter per second. So, if you use uh, red fuming nitric acid, that is like a, this is uh, ammonium perchlorate and HVB is a solid propellant. RFNA is the red fuming nitric acid and RP1, that is a rocket propellant one. So, we can further improve the, this is a liquid propellant which can, uh, we can get the specific impulse of around 2630 meter per second. So, if you use uh, the uh, liquid uh, oxygen, 
and uh, HTBB. This is like a hybrid. Uh, this is the hybrid uh, propellant. HTBB is a solid. Liquid hydrogen is a liquid in liquid state. So we can uh, get the specific impulse of around 3,240 meter per second. So if you use uh, liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, we can get the specific impulse of around 3,796. It's around some 4,000 meter per second. So if you use uh, uh, this is these are all like conventional propellants as of now. Uh, we are using the ammonium perchlorate that is uh, 2,600 meter per second of propellant that is used for many of uh, many of the uh, rocket launching applications in the first and second first stages. And uh, red fumigant nitric acid. These are all like like a liquid propellant RFNA, RP1 plus LO2 and LH. The LH. These are all the uh, liquid and uh, <coughs> cryogenic propellants which is normally used in many many um, yeah. Applications. Okay, then <clears throat> this is like uh, these are all under chemical. If it is non-chemical, that is like advanced propulsion systems. Like if you use liquid hydrogen and some uh, this is U two U two thirty five is like a you know, nuclear uh, rocket. Okay, so which is giving very high, which is giving very high uh, specific impulse, whereas. Uh, the development of uh, this kind of system is uh, very very crucial because uh, nuclear or advanced propulsion systems we require some other energy to create this kind of energy. So that is the major uh, hurdles. So still people are working like uh, <coughs> nuclear rockets and ionic propulsion and uh, plasma propulsion uh, techniques. So these are all like under uh, developing uh, stage. So this is in the rocket technology. You can see, like <clears throat> in the chemical engines, use high temperature chemical reaction to produce high energy in particles that ejected from the engine. So it is producing thrust. So it has to contain both fuel as well as also laser. It, it should be in the same form that that will be good. Like if you use engine, uh, it's like car. We can use some kerosene and uh, liquid oxygen or uh, gaseous oxygen. Okay. So, if you use uh, car is a gasoline and oxygen, we are getting oxygen from the air, and it is uh, produces hydrocarbons. Where you, you use kerosene and liquid oxygen, the fuel is kerosene and liquid oxygen is the oxidizer, and it produces hydrocarbon. If you use liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, it is in, in that in that uh, hydrogen is a fuel, oxidizer is oxygen. It produces only pure water. So that's why everybody is working and uh, looking for the hydrogen as a Alternative fuel in uh, any kind of energy uh, application. Then, <clears throat> if you use uh, liquid hydrogen and liquid fl uh, fluorine, so uh, obviously hydrogen is the fuel. Liquid fluorine is the oxidizer, <clears throat> which is giving more uh, thrust. But the problem is, it gives hydrofluoric acid. It is a very very corrosive in nature, so that that's why people are not using that. So then we'll come to each and every rocket uh, the, uh, types. It's like solid chemical rocket engine. So in that, just one minute. Okay, so then uh, we'll start the solid rock, chemical rocket engine. So it's like, so <clears throat> in any kind of rocket, so it is like we, it should contain both fuel as well as oxidizer. So first we will see the solid uh, chemical rocket engine. So in that, so we can uh, have some different uh, uh, options. Out of that, it's like it should be like chemical, the uh, both fuel as well as oxidizer should be chemically stable until the combustion. So until we start up the combustion, so so we can have some uh, in this case, C we can see that the end burning grain that is a constant com uh, combustion surface are exposed like a cigarette burning. So it gives constant thrust for our mission. 
so you can have another core burning also it is like in that we have a cylindrical propellant grain so you can see the combustion surface or like inside the uh, inner diameter of the cylindrical cylinder, cylinder cylindrical surface so uh, requirement we can have this type of thrust profile also it is continuously we the thrust has to be increased so it is like a, a typical uh, solid rocket motor uh, casing so it's like you can see that uh, this is this is the cylindrical uh, grain configuration you can see the outer motor case so then we can have some thermal insulation because uh, we are using the, the the solid rocket solid propellants are almost like uh, uh, it uh, the radiation effect will uh, affect the motor case so for that we require some thermal insulation to inhibit the motor casing from the propellant uh, propellant uh, burnt, uh, propellant uh, burning temperature so you can see that the igniter so igniter so it is uh, to in initiate the ignition so once we the igniter is getting uh, uh, giving charge to all over the propellant surface grain so in the dual composition grains means in the first composition gives very high burning rate so that we can have more thrust then again it come down okay then the, we have sustaining of the thrust then after that we have another grain it is going to burn so during this uh, burning the grain will uh, burn at very faster rate so you can have like m type of thrust profile from this grain so this is like advanced grain burn evaluation so if you have this kind of uh, propellant grain uh, shapes you can have different kind of thrust uh, um, uh, thrust levels we can have over a period of time so sometimes it is uh, for missile application some uh, strategic missiles it this kind of propellant grain uh, structures required so for in this uh, in this grain also we can have different propellant grain uh, compositions two types of grains is uh, uh, is adopted so that we can have different kind of thrust uh, profiles okay so this is like a ariane 5 solid rocket booster so what are all the parts major parts which is uh, used in that so you can see some payloads and the uh, solid boosters solid rocket boosters and the main engine and the telemetry all these things are like here it is uh, explained you can see that is uh, forward attachment this is the space shuttle so in this uh, we are they are, they are it is the uh, 237 tons of propellant solid uh, propellant uh, uh, weight then motor mass is 273 total motor mass is 273 out of that you can see propellant mass itself 237 it's around some 80 to 85 percentage of uh, mass of the total motor is containing propellant so it is a uh, stbb based propellant so it can produce the thrust of around some uh, 5.4 uh, mega newton It's around some 550 tons of core requirement. The burn time is only 2.16 minutes. That is 130 seconds. So within that, it reaches the first stage. So the next, it is going the next stage. So you can see some different kind of parts. Okay, in that. okay so then mostly the specific impulse of the solid rocket motors is lies within uh, 2000 to 2600 uh, meter per second actually in terms of second also we can say that is 200 to 250 seconds it is it is about the conversion whether it is you are using more meter per second or seconds then burn rate it will be like 1 to 15 uh, mm per second pressure is around some uh, 70 7 to 20 mbi that means 70 bar to 200 bar the combustion efficiency is very high it's like uh, even though it is a fuel rich propellant uh, it is uh, combustion efficiency is around 0.95 to 95 to 98 percent thrust to weight ratio is very high so throttle is very difficult as i told you it's very difficult to uh, 
control the thrust or stop the operations in between then uh, stop or restart that is also not practicable so lifetime it's like down to 15 hour, uh, years because it is uh, since we are using hydroxy terminated polybutadiene this is a rubber kind of material so over a period of time the rubber material rubber rubbery kind of material will get degraded so that's why uh, more than uh, 15 years after 15 years the performance of the solid propellant will be coming down so that we should we cannot use it so but any anyway, for rocket applications it's not a problem because since uh, once we mission is uh, planned so within one or two years the rocket is getting launched whereas in uh, missile application we have to keep it for long time so then it's a problem so we have to get uh, we have to destroy the missile uh, propellant so then we have to start new one so then the next is the liquid propellant engines so in the liquid propellant uh it's not like solid propellant it's like whether uh, fuel as well as oxygen is mixed uh, uh, thoroughly and we can uh, uh, burn it whether it is in the in terms of uh, liquid propellant the uh, fuel as well as oxidizer to be stored in a separate tank then we have to pressurize also for a particular to the required uh, pressure level then we can have the combustion chamber and the nozzle so it's like so the major problem is we have to pressurize both fuel as well as oxidizer so that is the major challenging process in this uh, liquid propellant uh, liquid uh, propellant so it is used for uh, launches interplanetary travels and uh, it's more uh, more versatile than solid rocket because the amount of thrust can be controlled and uh, they are less reliable than solid rocket in the reliability in terms of uh, because solid rocket it's on the solid propellant so it's, it is uh, reliable but whereas uh, liquid propellant rockets it's not uh, very much reliable there is combustion instability a lot of things are uh, occurred so this is the uh, space shuttle uh, plumbing uh, configurations you can see that uh, you can see the fuel oxidizer uh, that uh, brown on oxidizer and the fuel so it has to be uh, feed into the combustion chamber or the liquid propellant combustion chamber through turbo pumps because we require very high pressure at the combustion chamber so for that we have to pressurize the both fuel as well as oxidizer at very high pressure then the combustion will happen and uh, we can have the nozzle so it creates the thrust so they you can see the construction again it is the same thing so for different applications we require different kind of uh, uh, pressure pressurizing the fuel and oxidizer uh, requirements it's like you can see from this uh, first one the left one oxidizer tank on the fuel tank the pump is there the pump is operated by the driven by the uh, turbine through gas generator so then we have the valve so it uh, creates very high pressure so that we can have the um thrust from that it is a pump fed rocket then pressure fed rocket means we have some high pressure uh, cylinders to pressurize the oxidizer as well as fuel so then we can have the valve and we can have the combustion chamber combustion happens so the in the liquid rocket engine one more problem is like uh, heat transfer is also very uh, the heat uh, heat is also very high at the nozzle so we have to have some cooling mechanism to cool the nozzle parts so in the liquid propellant this is in the configuration you can see the specific impulse you can get around to 2500 to 3800 meters per second burn rate it depends based on the fuels and the chamber pressure is around 2 to 10 mba because it's, uh, uh, it's not like solid rocket so liquid rockets we have to give more uh, Uh, that is uh, it's a challenging process for uh, the process this is a cryogenic propellant then it produces uh, the propellant mass is around 150 158 tons the total mass is 170 tons so it can produce 880 kilo newton at sea level at vacuum level it is like 1130 kilo newtons 
The specific impulse is 430 seconds in vacuum. Chamber pressure is 110 bar. Expansion ratio is 4.5 is to 1. So 45 is to 1. Sorry. Burn time is 600 seconds. So you can see different uh, lines which is uh, required for uh, pumping the liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen in the uh, combustion chamber. You can see gaseous helium. So normally helium is used to synthesize inert gas. So there is no problem uh, even for sloshing also because whenever there is a uh, acceleration in the vehicle, there is a liquid oxygen as well as liquid uh, hydrogen will get there is a problem of sloshing. So if you use the inert material, there is no problem of uh, compatibility. Then liquid helium, then uh, gaseous. This, these are all the lines you can see that that the hot gases is coming out. Then uh, liquid hydrogen. So the hydrogen is a very very um, we have to handle it very very carefully since it is having uh, the explosion sensitivity and the diffusivity is all very high. So we have to be very very careful. Uh, we have to deal it very carefully. So you can have different kind of so like LOX liquid oxygen turbo pump thrust chamber igniter. Then liquid hydrogen turbo pump, then gas generators and starters. So these are all the major requirements. So, so even though there's so much complications are there in the uh, fourth stages, most of the uh, GSLV that is uh, geosynchronous satellite launch vehicles used to be cryogenic propellants. This kind of So we can see that uh, now we go into the hybrid rocket. So in the hybrid rocket, either fuel or uh, like, uh, solid, uh, oxidizer in different stages. So let's say if it is uh, liquid is a fuel, then oxidizer is a uh, oxidizer is uh, um, solid stage. Here in this uh, thing, you can see liquid is uh, uh, oxidizer is in liquid stage, uh, fuel is in solid stage. So this is a solid gray, uh, that uh, brown one. Then this uh, blue one is a fuel that is oxidizer. So even though uh, here also, since we are using liquid, we should use some pressurization system to increase the pressure of the liquid. So once it before it enters into the um, grain that is the um, fuel uh, portion, the liquid has to be pressurized to the certain pressure level. So then only we can get enough thrust from the nozzle. So the hybrid rocket always, uh, whenever we are going for hybrid, there is a problem of combustion instability. That is another issue, but still, the specific impulses are very less only. So it's like two ten seconds to sorry two two thousand hundred second meter per second to three thousand two hundred meter per second. The regression rate is also very less. It's like 0.225. The chamber pressure is two to five MBA. Combustion efficiency is around some 0.9 to 95 9, 0.95. That is 95 percentage. Thrust to weight ratio is medium. Throttle is also possible and stop and restart also possible. The lifetime is also very long since the fuel and oxidizer in a different stage, stage, stage states. So there is no problem of compatibility and other issues. But mostly it is not used in uh, uh, rocket applications, mostly used in uh, missile applications. Because uh, there is some uh, um, strategic missions and some uh, boost and sustain uh, requirements are there. So for that, we require hybrid rockets. So you can see the hybrid rocket uh, combustion zone. You can see that, <coughs> that the solid fuel, that is the fuel is in solid state. <coughs> this uh, combustion, uh, this is the, uh, the liquid fuel is um, going above the solid fuel. So you can see what are all the layers that is in terms of micro level. You can see different kind of, uh, because 
even if they both the fuel and oxidizer in a, a same state it is very easy for getting combustion where it is uh, in different stages the combustion is always happening in a particular state mostly in gaseous uh, stage so here you can see that the solid fuel has to be gasified before it is getting into combust uh, that is it is get, getting into combustion with the uh, so liquid fuel okay so that's why we have different kind of uh, zones which is uh, it's a micro level microscopic level we can see that fuel vapor zone diffusion zone all the diffusion flame zone all these things are happens so within the boundary layer you can see this thing so because of that there is a combustion instability that means instability is nothing but it is like it's not giving a constant thrust sometimes the thrust variation is there okay so that that is because of the solid fuel grain so that solid fuel grain has to be uh, continuously and uniformly it has to be deca that is it has to be gasified but sometimes it, it may not be possible because uh, the solid fuel grain is getting gasified based on the heat which is getting from the flame okay that is the combustion flame so sometimes if there is any undulations or uh, oscillation that's in the flame so the uh, heat transfer is also varied towards the solid fuel grain so accordingly based on the heat transfer accordingly the solid fuel uh, gasification that is the solid fuel vaporization also will vary so it will uh, like it's like a feedback kind of thing so it is like then it uh, alters the uh, vaporization rate it uh, again it alters the combustion uh, rate that the uh, flame structure okay so then uh, it is like continuously once un until it gets steady state sometimes the thrust level is also will vary based on the fluctuations of the flame okay so then again we have some comparison of between liquid and solid propulsion you can see so liquid propulsion we can regulate the flow of fuel and oxidizer with valves even computer controls also nowadays and there we adjust the thrust level can stop and later restart the engine it is more dangerous because the liquid produces volatile spoons that may be corrosive toxic or explosive so that is uh, it's not it we have to be handled with care the solid propulsion and the solid propellant it's like one started cannot stop burning cannot adjust thrust level while burning that is the major disadvantage where it is uh, our main advantage is it is a safer to store and handle so that is the major advantage but anyhow so based on different applications we have to use this but the complication is very high at liquid propellant rather than solid propellant okay so the thrust vectoring so to control the uh, to change the direction of the rockets or missile we have to use some thrust controlling already we have seen the flex nozzle in the uh, solid propellant so here also same thing it is there so most engines needs uh, a way to steer the rocket on its design designated flight path so it has to be achieved by using the thrust vector control mostly the you can see the gimbaled nozzle so that gimbaled nozzle can be tilted to particular direction so that you can change the direction of the rocket path okay so in space then we will go to the space application when when the rocket exits the earth atmosphere most manned vehicles do not fire their engines in space this is explained the newton's first law everybody remains in a state of rest or uniform motion unless it is acted by an external unbalanced force to make little adjustment to ocean for reentry and rocket car similar engines called rcs that is a, a reaction control systems these thrusters allow astronauts to change altitude at any in any desired direction they also can control the rotation so once we keep the position on once we keep the satellite or space shuttle in a particular uh, orbit uh, we don't have to give uh, extra power to orbit to over the earth but the thing is whenever there is uh, we have to reorbit the things or uh, uh, we have to change the orbit locations then we have to use some uh, small engines because we require in terms of uh, it requires only millinewtons uh, level of thrust to change the orbit at the particular uh, 
from one bar bit to another bar bit. Even uh, even if you see the GSLB or PSLB also, after some time, the satellites may deviate from its path due to some uh, frictions or uh, some foreign unwanted particles. So so again, after two or three years, we have to uh, again re make the position to the original uh, orbit of the satellite. So then we have to use some the re reaction control system to uh, correct the orbit path. Yeah, then again, the new propulsion systems, like uh, we have different kind of uh, pro pro propulsion systems. It's like, uh, it, it, these are all like more efficient and reliable than liquid and solid rockets we use today. But some new technologies like nuclear propulsion, ion propulsion, electromagnetic propulsion, and solar sailing. So these are all like advanced concepts, but still it is in under uh, developing stage. So, but the nuclear propulsion in terms of uh, safety, ion propulsion and electromagnetic propulsion, we have to give some power, some electrical power to make the ion propulsion to be, uh, to work on it. So then solar sailing, it is it is based on the solar uh, rays, the, but the, in the in the all the advanced propulsion systems, uh, the thrust level is very low, but the ISP, that is specific impulse, is very high. But yeah, but sometimes for reaction control systems, we are using the electromagnetic based propulsion system, like Hall thrusters. Again, it is the same thing. So it's uh, like advanced propulsion systems in that electric nuclear or microwave engines can be used. So even lasers also can be used as a working fluid to propel the vehicle. So here the laser is there using as a working fluid. The power, the laser has to be, yeah, laser has to get some power from the external source. Then that is the problem. So then uh, even you, you can see that the laser uh, efficiency is within five to ten, uh, five to ten percent from the electrical power so that uh, it uh, hampers the this advanced propulsion systems uh, development so the launch vehicles rocket launch spacecraft carry astronauts that orbit uh, earth and travel into space these rockets like the ones used to launch probes and satellites are called launch vehicles so so whenever we are launching some uh, uh, payloads, then we can say it is a launch vehicle. So either it, it can be like astronauts or satellites. Yeah, this is the space shuttle. So you can see that the solid rocket boosters, orbiters, and the space shuttle engines. So, so the external tank mostly used uh, liquid fuels. So. So the initial solid rockets uh, boosters are uh, uh, expand, uh, expanded. Once it reaches the uh, space station, international space station, then the fuel tank, that is the orbiter, no? That that thing again, it has to come back to the Earth once the scientific uh, experiments are over in IS. Okay, so then you can see how the rockets are entering into the orbit. So first, so once we, uh, once the rockets are uh, positioned at a particular uh, orbit and uh, revolving around the Earth, so the balance forces of the attraction forces by the gra uh, Earth gravitation, Earth gravitational force is nullified by the centrifugal force of the satellite so that it is revolving around the earth without no external power supply. Okay, so that is the rocket center into the orbit. Then escape velocity. So what is meant by actually escape velocity? So if you give enough velocity to overcome the earth gravitational force and retains at a particular orbit, then 
it is positioned and revolving around the earth that is the called escape velocity so it is based on the uh, uh, the momentum which we are giving initial the, the thrust which is we are giving initial uh, uh, the rocket produced initial thrust so that is the escape velocity so you can see that uh, uh, it is orbital velocity and the escape velocity orbital velocity is like uh, the once it reaches the earth orbit it revolves around the earth escape velocity is it has to escape from the earth gravitation force it goes into the other planets like uh, like moon or some other uh, mars planets something like that is called escape velocity it is solely depends upon the uh, thrust of the initial thrust which is uh, given uh, uh, generated by the rocket for different mission applications we have different uh, uh, thrust levels it's mostly the velocities so this is the geosynchronous orbit the orbit that holds satellite that revolve around the earth at the same rate the earth rotates okay so it is like the, the, it is mostly used for relay tv signals and map weather patterns it is like if you see the satellite uh, position from the earth at any uh, even uh, morning or evening you can see it is a same position that means called geosynchronous so earth is also rotating and revolving and uh, satellite is also rotating as well as uh, revolving around the earth so that means the reactive coordinates between the earth position and the satellite position is same at any point of time so that is called geosynchronous so so the, the geo, first the nasa has begun to develop the new communication satellites in 1960 based on the hypothesis that geosynchronous satellites which orbit earth around some 35900 km above the ground so that is like optimal optimistic um, orbit uh, to keep the geosynchronous satellite offer the best location because high orbit allowed the satellites orbitals to uh, speed to match the rotation speed of the earth and therefore remain essentially stable over the same spot so yeah not only uh or done it and uh, now every country is having the geosynchronous satellite for their uh, telecommunication applications and map weather uh, forecasting so last one it's a uh, space station so space station is required because uh, uh, in earth we have the gravitational uh, force effect so if you go to very high altitudes so uh, if you go at very high altitudes or if you go another planet uh, the even though chemical reaction rate biological activities everything is different compared to the earth because in earth you can you can have the g value 9.81 meter per second square whereas if you go to moon based on its mass that is 1 by 6th of mass only it is uh, having so uh, obviously the ma mass of the uh any object in uh, moon is around 1 by 6th of earth uh, mass okay so, uh, so it's uh, something like that so then if you go to space station we can have uh, gravity free environment so we can do lot of experiments scientific experiments biological experiments so that we can either uh, improve the uh, yeah you can get some optimum level of reaction rate or uh, also even we can develop some products also out of that so that's why the that uh, international space station has been developed so in which uh, people live long periods for life type lifetime so international space station is the contribution of several countries it is built by russia uh, uh, officially but us many countries europe uh, european countries all the countries are it's around some 40 countries are uh, involved to, to to develop the to develop and build the space station international space station okay so thank you for all your uh, watching this rocket science uh, presentation so if you have any questions or comments so you can contact me hello yeah thanks for wonderful lecture professor and uh, 
we will receive any questions on offline and uh, make it thank you okay okay thank you dr jay kumar thank you very much